you don't have to do that, but okay. <laughs> um, I'm excited. I have the privilege today, and it is a privilege, to launch a new sermon series. Look at that. Deep calls. And so you'll know more about that by the end, but can we just pause and breathe in that graphic? Thank you. Thank you, Naomi. That is the right response. Wow. I just, I just, that says so much to me. And uh, it kind of has autumn tones and what a beautiful weather we're in right now. Did anybody pause and breathe this morning? It's so beautiful. In fact, I, I actually walked up to the office and I pictured us having church outside. Um, we're not there, so pretend we are as we go. But if you, if you know, if you're a student of scripture, you'll recognize immediately that that is from Psalm 42.7, uh, which gets quoted a lot just because it is such a beautiful and meaningful scripture. Deep calls to deep in the roar, most translations say at the roar, of your waterfalls. All your breakers and waves have rolled over me. And some of you would have heard, because we've said it here, the message translation, Eugene Peterson translates it or paraphrases it this way. Chaos calls to chaos. To the tune of Whitewater Rapids, your breaking surf, talking to the Lord, your thundering breakers crash and crush me. Now, that's not a scripture for your left hemisphere, my friends. That's a mystery scripture. Your right hemisphere has to go, wow, I need to meditate on that. I need to relate to that because one thing we know is your left hemisphere says, yeah, you're sending all these breakers and waves and crushing me, but we know God doesn't do that. God doesn't send bad stuff to crush us. So something else is going on here. And so today, as I set this up, what our series is going to be, we're going to look a little deeper. So in the reason Eugene Peterson can use the word chaos there is that the definition of deep in the Greek or in the Hebrew there, it means confusion, an empty place, without form, nothing, vain, vanity, waste, from a word that means abyss. So there's been movies called The Abyss, which is the deep, darker, and more mysterious than anything that you really don't want to travel to. I don't even like movies about people being stuck underwater. I don't like watching that. I relate too much to the screen, and then I go, give me breath. But you know, I'll say more about that in a second. But what does that sound like to you? That definition, doesn't that sound like Genesis 1, uh, where it talks about the condition of the earth? Genesis 1, 2. Darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Holy Spirit was hovering. And we always say, whenever darkness is covering, the Holy Spirit is hovering. So we're in touch with the darkness, but the Holy Spirit is hovering, and he's about to speak light. And I just know that a lot of people have been living in a place like that, and I just believe that God wants to announce great hope for you. So that depth is tohu vabohu. It's kind of like that place of creation before we knew it was going to be good. Because when it was without form and void, that's what the Hebrew tohu vabohu means, without form and void. Just, just pause and think about the fact that God made this beautiful world, that autumn we're seeing out there, from a place that was without form and void. Surely he can work with whatever situation you're in. And first step one is believe he's hovering. So the Living Bible says, I hear the tumult of the raging seas as your waves and surging tides sweep over me. So that's not talking about surging tides of trouble and life's trials. That's talking, the, at least he turns it to the surging tides of love, of presence, of spirit. There's more going on here than just waves of trouble. When the enemy comes in, comma, like a flood, the spirit of the Lord returns against him. But here's the best one of all, the Passion Translation. Again, a paraphrase, but this one works. My deep need calls out to the deep kindness of your love. And so today we're going to take a look at that. But let me say again, I just want to repeat, I want to remove your aloneness if, if this is you, that so many times we see this as waves and breakers of trouble, don't we? And so we're just going to for a minute admit life hits us sometimes. And sometimes the waves are great when they're gentle and beautiful, 
But when they're hard and rogue, and they keep coming, don't they? Sometimes you're like, not again. Oh, yeah, here it comes. This is one of the most famous paintings in history. Um, it's, they, they say it's probably the most reproduced image in the history of art. And it's the Great Wave off Kanagawa. It's a wood block from 1831 by the Japanese artist Hokusai. And you can easily find it on a shower curtain if you're interested. Or a tote bag. Um, but you know what's cool is this was, he did, that's a fractal. He did the mathematics before it was available to the minds of men. He did it from his intuitive sense that nature is roughly beautiful like that. Isn't it? Do you think it's beautiful? I think it's beautiful. Um, but do you see the little boat? Here's one boat. There's some more boats. But then there's a dude right there. There's a dude right there that's not in good shape, is he? And uh, most people believe that, that the artist saw a tsunami or a rogue wave that inspired this. And sometimes what hits you, you don't have to raise your hand because it wouldn't matter if you did. I'll just leave mine up. Sometimes don't you feel like the dude in the little boat, like a tsunami or a rogue wave, the one you didn't see coming. So it's okay that you feel that, but today I want to give you a new story. All your waves and breakers have gone over me, that is not onslaughts of trouble, y'all, even though that may have happened in life. But the more that hits you in life, the more you are qualified for all the waves and breakers of his love, his goodness, his spirit, his provision. Where anything negative abounds, grace does much more abound. So that's what we're going to look at today. My deep, I want to say my poverty-stricken deep, and I don't just mean financial poverty, I mean whatever poverty, my poverty of understanding, of meaning, of freedom, whatever it is, my poverty-stricken deep is calling out to his rich deep. And all the waves and breakers of him answering that call, crash and crush me? Yeah, come on, crush me with that. I don't want to be crushed with the troubles of life, but I'm a candidate for being crushed by the goodness of God that's more than I can take. And he wants to do that and show up in our lives. Now, did you know that in addition, oh, skipped. There's another slide there. The Greek word, I just wanted to pause on the Greek, Greek word for that. Here's a scripture from Romans 11 that talks about the depths of God. Oh, the depth and riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past tracing out. So that means we wouldn't initially just go, oh, I see what you're doing. Like it's okay if we have to get to know him deeply to understand his ways because he's deeper than us. Does that make sense? So never be discouraged if you don't on the surface understand everything about God. That's your call to go deeper with him. That's exactly what that is. Through, for of him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. God's depths are not meant to scare you away or cause you despair, but rather for you to bathe in. He made everything, and his depths actually understand everything. And he doesn't just go, oh, welcome to my, whoops, I have to remember this table can't look. It went, <laughs> it did not support me. Y'all probably didn't even see it, but I felt it. I went, oh. <laughs> do you want to see it again? Because I can do this all day. Anyway, uh, his depths are there for us to find peace and meaning in, but you gotta be patient. It's a whole different ball game than just, please I would like a printout of why this happened. Please I would like a printout of the next four steps of my life. How many of you have asked for that and God went, I love you, let's hug. <laughs> yep, yep, that's exactly our lives, okay? So deep in the Greek is the word bathos. You see it down at the bottom. Wonder what English word comes from bathos. Anyway, <laughs> uh, bathos, depth, deep water, fullness, immensity. Here's my favorite, and I put them in bold. Profundities, things that are profound. Like, let me demonstrate profound. Is like it's said to you and you go, whoa. I hope that happened. Yeah, mind blown, exactly. I hope somehow before this is over, you're sitting there going, whoa, today. That'd be victory in my outward 
uh, mind, but you do you, whatever you need to do. Then deep laid plans. Hey, you think God has some deep laid plans for you? Do you think he might have some deep laid plans for you that you are not yet aware of? Do you think that a bunch of the stuff that's come against you that you think is so wrong might actually be being worked into some deep laid plans? Because he's not put off. Can I just remind you, he's not in heaven going, oh no, I didn't see them getting in this situation. Let's call a council and talk about what can we do now. He's not doing that. He's only looking at his deep laid plans. And the next word there talks about the riches of his wisdom and knowledge. In other words, he's never caught off guard. Deep is calling to deep. Talking about deep laid plans, this is what I was excited to show you. In addition to the surface currents of the ocean that are the top 100 meters and caused by winds, did you know that there are deep currents in the ocean? And it's actually, this is them, the blue are the cooler ones, the, war the red are the warmer ones. They circle the globe and they're actually called the global conveyor belt. And they're caused by differences in salinity and in temperature. Get this, a cubic centimeter of water, they projected that if it travels around the globe at the speed of those deep currents, a cubic centimeter of water takes a thousand years. That's how big they are. They're not fast. They're slow. On the surface, they're super fast, like 100 times faster. But they're 16 times more powerful than the surface currents. Isn't that amazing? So what I hear is that there's these ancient truths that have been surging ever since the world appeared. But they're deep. And they don't, they're not in a hurry. Don't you wish God was in a hurry? At least your flesh does. But the reason he doesn't have to be hurry, there's a book called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. Anybody heard of it? It's a great contemplative book, and I've owned it for 10 years and not read it because I'm not in a hurry. <laughs> That's not the truth, but it is the truth. Anyway, God is not in a hurry hurry. He can do things. He can be fast because he's outside the realm of time. It looks fast to us. But slow and fast are the same to him. And the deep things of God are working in your life. And if it takes a cubic centimeter of water a thousand years to travel the global conveyor belt, I want to tell you there's some global conveyor belts of the power of the cross that are always in motion. And they're way more powerful than a surface encounter. They're way more powerful than a mere goosebump. We like goosebumps. We like, I feel it. But there's some things that are so deep, feeling doesn't even make sense. Your mind has to go, whoa, what? That's deep. And God has some depths for you. So Jesus said to his disciples at one place, launch out into the deep. And this was when he had genius. He uh, took Simon's boat, Simon who would become Peter. He took his boat, borrowed his boat, and he pushed out a little to use it to preach to the multitudes because he was using the natural amplification of his voice hitting the water. And it was a, just the wisdom of God in him knew how to make an amplif amplification system, a PA system, before there was electricity. And then, because Jesus never asks you for anything that he doesn't reward you 100 times over, he turned to Peter and he said, because he just used Peter's boat, He'd commandeered it, really, in a way, but he turned to Peter, and then he said, launch out into the deep for, and let down your nets for a great catch. And Peter said, bless your heart, Jesus. We've been fishing all night. You don't know anything. You're not a fisherman. Bless your little heart. We've fished all night, and we've caught nothing. He said, nevertheless, at your word. And they launched out, and this was the place of what Oral Roberts used to call the net-breaking, boat-sinking load. They caught so many fish. Like, he knew where the school was. He knew the currents of the deep. Yeah. And I want to tell you, we're not fishermen, but the call still comes to us, launch out into the deep. Whatever you're dissatisfied with in your life, whatever's gone wrong, whatever's hurt, the call comes to you, launch out deeper. And we always go, you understand, Lord, I've analyzed it. 
<laughs> it's so sweet how you think there's something out there deeper. Anybody with me today? Or have y'all, you may not say that to him, but your feelings go, <laughs> launch out into the deep. <laughs> but he's always right, isn't he? So what there needs to come is that nevertheless. Now, I'm going to tell you a story. How many of you have been snorkeling? This is scuba diving, but I'm talking about snorkeling. Okay, this is a story about the first time I went snorkeling. The summers, Jeff and Donna, and, well, this was a cruise that we went on for Joe and Matt. Matt, who was on drums, Joe's off and on guitar. For their senior year, we went on a cruise to several spots, and one of them was Roatan, Honduras, and you could snorkel. And I had never snorkeled in my life. And we picked the excursion. And I think on the, on the cruise, if you've done this before, they explain, they give you your little equipment and they explain it. And then the bus went to the beach and we get out there. And both of our families are out in the water snorkeling, but not me, because I've never been before. And <clears throat> listen, sometimes this thing is a hindrance. It feels totally counterintuitive to me. I'm not even going under. Snorkeling's on the top. But I'm putting my face way down there in the water, and I'm like, it's counterintuitive to breathe. It felt like I couldn't breathe even though I had a thing. Thank you for the few people that are nodding because you understand what I'm saying. It just was like I could not wrap my head around. Like, I can breathe because I have this tube, but everything in me feels like I'm going to just drown. Strange, strange. And I was, I was blocked. And I was about to go, y'all just go. In fact, my husband is the most patient man on the entire planet. But he knew how to snorkel, and he really got, he left me behind. Thank you for saying it so I didn't have to. He got really tired of, Paul is an exhorter. If you know anything about the spiritual gifts uh, in Romans 12, he's an exhorter. And one thing about an exhorter is if they will give you steps and advice and lovingly coach you, if you do not do them or if they perceive you're not doing them, they are done with you <laughs> for a minute. They come back. So... <laughs> Yeah, that too. So here we are, and Paul, finally, the, the Eagle Scout Paul that's done the adventures, uh, he goes off and snorkels with the people that know how. And I'm just playing around where I can stand up in the water, right? And uh, Jeff Summers comes along. He goes, you know, you struggling? And I said, a little bit. And uh, he said, hey, I know you. He said, just pretend you're meditating. That's all he said. And it literally clicked me out of my left hemisphere into my right. It clicked me out of <sighs> concrete analysis. I need a bigger book. I need more instruction. It clicked me into, oh, oh, it's not about that. This isn't a thing to conquer. This is a thing to enjoy. And I put my head down, and it's all I needed. And, I mean, I was turned into another person. And I started seeing the fish, and they were colorful, and they were neon, and they were sprinkled throughout the water like confetti. And I would go down and go, whoa, like it was everything I wanted it to be. And then I'd come up and go, Jeff, it worked. It was like life changing. It was amazing. It was all I needed. But the, oh, oh, and I got so lost in it. There, I kept seeing one little black thing darting in and out of my field of vision. And I was going to find it. I was determined I was going to find it. I was like, I mean, I have, a, I have a degree in biology. I was like, what is that? I must see that. This is, you know. And every time I'd turn, it would dart away. And I thought, this, that, wow, this is, that thing's got good locomotive. And, you know, it's like it's responding to me. And something's going on in nature. It was the spigot thing on my vest. <laughs> so that every time I turned left, it moved with me. <laughs> I was dancing with the valve on my vest as I meditated. And when I figured it out, even that was, I was just like, I, I was absolutely, the, here's the deal. Religion will keep you analyzing how to breathe. Religion will make you feel deprived of ox oxygen. But reality will get you lost in the view. So much so you'll chase a valve if you think it's alive. It was, it was life-changing for me. I'm not ready to scuba dive, but that was life changing. <laughs> I'll look at the films of what who else scuba dive. Okay, so for this series, here's 
Here's, we're calling it deep calls, dot, dot, dot. You can take that two ways. I call this deep two ways. The first is the verb. Deep is calling to you. There is more to explore in the vast realm where reality meets intimacy. There's more for you than you currently have. Deep is calling you. Or deep calls a noun, like a calling inside you. There are callings hidden inside you that will infuse your life with purpose and meaning. And I don't just mean callings to ministry because all of us are in ministry. There are callings of specific gifts that you have, every one of you. And when you discover them, that's a part of your healing. Because I guarantee you, most of us, our callings have been perverted into something that looks negative. The strategies of the enemy take a real gift and calling from God and employ it in a different way. And God's the whole while trying to train us to understand, here's why I created you that way. And that's what the Abbey lives to help you with. So, the essence of the new covenant, we just said this on Wednesday night, is they shall all know me. That comes from Hebrews 8, 11 and Jeremiah 31, 34. In other words, God did not just say, know me, know me, know me. He put himself in you so you know him from the inside. So your knowing him is a personalized version that can only come through you. Wow. And in that, it's your option how deep that goes. It, his, his goal is they shall all know me. He wants to go as deep as you invite him. I mean, he's put himself in the very core of you. But in terms of walking it out, the invitation is calling to you. He will dance with you at any level you welcome him to the floor. If you want to do a solo dance, he'll clap from the stands. But if you want a partner, he stands waiting. Many, uh, well, in 1997, Delirious, and that's Delirious, and uh, this church has great history. We, we know them. We are still friends with uh, one in particular we still talk to. Um, and so we used to do a lot of their music, and we did this song. I don't know how many of you have been around Christianity long enough to remember the song, I Want to Go Deeper. And it says, I want to go deeper, but I don't know how to swim. What a great line. That's like me and the snorkeling. That song went to number 20 in the UK charts. It's the only Christian song that ever topped. They don't have Christian charts in the UK, at least they didn't back then. And it was number 20 right in the middle of all the secular songs. And Delirious, because of it, ended up opening for Bon Jovi and Matchbox 20 on one tour of the UK, which was unheard of for a Christian band. That song had so much to say about God calling us deeper. It was kind of the word of the time is like, hey dudes, there's something deeper to this Christianity thing, anybody interested? And so they went out and sang it all over and people listened to it. Has some great lines that set, like one of them says, I wanna go deeper, but is it just a stupid whim? And then that, that's what your left hemisphere says. Your, when your heart is crying out, I wanna go deeper with you, God. Your left hemisphere goes, okay, but like, let's hurry and make some money so we can pay the bills. And your heart is saying, yeah, but something bigger right now that may inform my bill paying is at work in me. There's a, there's a place where Martin Smith wrote, the wonder of it all is I'm living just to fall more in love with you. That's the secret of deeper. And then the very last line of the song says, hold me in your arms just like any father would. That, my friends, is the deepest. And that will inform everything else in your life that needs informing. So, God's calling us deeper. There are deep calls. Your touch of him is different when deep has called you. So remember the woman, Mark chapter 5, the woman known as the woman with the issue of blood, which always cracks me up because that is a King James wording. I mean, we don't go to the doctor and go, excuse me, I have an issue of blood. We don't use that wording anymore, and yet she was immortalized as that. But that dear woman, she had been bleeding 12 years nonstop, and she had been hearing about Jesus, and she said in her heart, if I can touch his garment, I'll be made whole. So she presses through the crowd. The crowd is thronging him, the Bible actually says. They're all up against him. But she presses through, 
And when she touches him, he feels, the Bible says, virtue. It's, it's arete is the Greek. It's like a power, a, a power of virtue. He feels it leave him and go into her. And he turns around in the middle of this crowd and he goes, who touched me? And it's almost laughable. Like the Bible is funnier than we let it be. You got to slow down and read it. It's hilarious. And the disciples are like, he's losing it again. And they say, Master, the crowd is pressing in on you. I don't know if you just went to heaven and came back, but you're, you're being touched. And he goes, no, it was a different touch. And that's when he says, virtue left me. And so the woman trembling, now why was she trembling? Because she was ceremonially unclean. Leviticus says if you have an issue of blood that won't stop, don't leave your house until two weeks after it stops. So for 12 years, she technically shouldn't have left her house. And yet her faith was to press through that crowd and touch him and be made whole. Isn't that amazing? So her deep was calling out to him. All the people were going, let's see the master, let's hear the master, let's get healed, let's see the show. They were pressing on him, but virtue didn't leave him and go into them at that moment. But she had a deep call in her. And so she reached out and her touch was completely different than every other touch pressing in on him because there was a deep call. Doesn't that inspire you to want to be, like, the whole thing is, let's go deeper than just surface Christianity. Let's go deeper than just give me a blessing. Let's go deeper and say, make me whole, like she did. Because those are the touches that change people. And here's a picture of the crowd. You can see her in the middle somewhere there. And uh, the sad thing is, the, the scripture says, a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. Sometimes, sadly, the thing standing between you and Jesus is the crowd of his followers. Sometimes you may, a touch from a person can be the touch of God, but it isn't always. And sometimes it takes you pressing through people saying, you can't, you can't, you shouldn't, you shouldn't. Because as I say up there, most of that crowd, if they'd known her story, would have said, don't touch him, you're unclean. And if you feel like religion has said to you, don't press through, don't touch him, you're unclean, you need to press on through them. And you need to press on through to the real Jesus. And look what happened here. It even says in the book of Leviticus, if you really read it, it says if you touch that bleeding person, you become unclean. Or if you touch her garments, you become unclean and you have to be purified. Do you see that the polarity was reversed here? She, unclean, under the, old, under the law, would have touched him and made him unclean. And instead, she touched him and out of him came cleanness and went into her. That's how much the law was wrong. It was a schoolmaster to bring you to Christ, but the greater one was standing right there going, not using that system. Come on, y'all. Religion has kept us away from stuff that's already ours in Christ. Lies and qualifications and performance orientation have kept us away from so much. Press through that crowd. Sometimes the crowd of his followers isn't around him. It's in your brain. It's maybe what you were raised in or what you've heard over and over or what somebody said about you. But you can press through that crowd for a deeper touch. The deep misery in her, not just about the bleeding but the shame of it, the deep misery in her called out to the deep mystery in him. She didn't have a detailed understanding of how this healing was going to occur. She didn't even know what organ of her body it was coming from. She didn't know any of those details except something in me is calling out and I've got to act on it. The deep misery in her called out to the deep mystery in him and she responded and we can too. Here's another story. One more Bible story about the deep. And this, who knows the story of Jonah? It's an amazing story, and it's got some funny moments in it, I think, too. They might remember, yeah, this is a few longtime charismatics in here. There was a band called Lamb. I uh, thank you. I thought you I thought of you, Jackie Kay. Uh, they had a song called Jonah. And I could sing every word, but I'm not going to. It featured, it was very 70s rock. They were two Jewish hippies that got saved and formed a band. And it goes, Jonah, Jonah, Jonah. 
and it's very catchy. And so even all week as I studied, I kept hearing it in my head. You can't hear it right now, so I'm only at that party by myself, but maybe Jack and Kay are there too. Anyway, it was a great song. Okay, so the story is Jonah's a prophet, and God says to, J- to Jonah, go preach to Nineveh. So like every good prophet, he absolutely turns and goes the other way. (laughs) He literally goes, don't like Nineveh going that way. So it's like if God said, go to Azel, and you went, nope, I'm going to the coast (laughs) the other way. He goes to Tarshish, which is exactly the opposite. And a storm, a great, he gets on a boat, and a storm arises. And so you can see Jonah there. He finally identifies himself, because in that day, even pagans believed something's out of order in the spirit, you know, some spiritual thing's wrong. So what's making this storm come? And finally Jonah goes, it's me, I'm in rebellion. And they throw him over the side in the deep. And so the next thing that happens, we forget how this verse here, there's only four chapters to Jonah. uh, And this verse tells us the mercy of God. Chapter 1, verse 17 says, Now the Lord had appointed a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah spent three days and nights in the belly of the fish. What's in the belly of the fish? Yeah, darkness for sure, digestive juices, acids that eat things, uh, things that have been eaten. Who else spent three days and nights in the heart of somewhere? Jesus. So Jonah is clearly a type of Jesus, but The big thing I see with that verse is God appointed a fish. Where would Jonah have been with no great fish, great whale? Drown. So this great belly of this fish was his refuge, his mercy. And uh, after, while he's in there, he makes this big prayer to God. He starts quoting Psalms, wouldn't you? He starts quoting scripture. (laughs) Y'all ever been in a fix and all of a sudden you go, what scripture do I know? Give me a, what do I say? What do I say? And the Holy Spirit often gets in that. And then sometimes you just need to go, help. So Jonah, instead of going, help, that's the problem. He didn't know God that way. He starts quoting scripture because he knows God that way. And so he's, one of the things he says is, you cast me into the deep in the heart of the seas. The current swirled about me. Then he says, all your breakers and waves swept over me. He quotes Psalm 42, 7. Isn't that amazing? I didn't even realize he quoted that until I was studying this week, uh, verbatim. And then he says, the waters engulfed me to take away my life. The watery depths closed around me. And for some reason, I cannot cease to find this funny, but I know it's not because it would be torture to be in the belly of a whale. But he actually says, the seaweed wrapped around my head. And I still... I, I want to go, what did that look like? What did that feel like? Was it a type of Jesus' crown of thorns? Maybe. But still, Jonah wouldn't have known that, and the seaweed was just wrapped around his head. Was it a hair treatment? <laughs> but, I made the butt really big. You raise my life from the pit, O Lord my God. He starts quoting the Psalms of going downhill and the Psalms of resurrection. And so the next thing you know, the whale vomits him out onto the shore. And here's the greatest mercy scripture you'll ever read. Jonah 2.10, it says, and the Lord commanded the fish and it vomited him onto dry land. Sorry, this is the scripture. Jonah 3.1, then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to Nineveh. In other words, God didn't go, gave you a chance. Let's see if you can. He just came back and said, (laughs) here we are again. Go to Nineveh. So guess what Jonah does? He goes to Nineveh. (laughs) And he goes and tells them what the Lord tells him, which is in 40 days the city's going to be consumed. And guess what they do? These mean, hardcore Assyrian Ninevites, they repent. And they proclaim a solemn, I mean, repent with fasting. And to me, that's when it gets real. They're not eating, y'all. I thought y'all would laugh more at that. I'm just telling you, (laughs) when it affects, like, I'm going to skip a meal, that's some repentance. But the whole city does it together. God sees their heart, and he says, okay, I'm not going to destroy them. Here is Jonah at that point. And I love this picture. He says... Jonah, however, was greatly displeased, and he became angry. This is at the news that God's decided not to destroy Nineveh. 
He, so he prayed to the Lord saying, oh Lord, is this not what I said while I was still in my own country? In other words, isn't this why I went to Tarshish in the first place? This is why I was so quick to flee. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger, abounding in loving devotion, one who relents from sending disaster. So he's mad that God's not going to destroy him. Do you, do you, do you get that? So he's like, he's like, I knew it. I knew it. I knew you were going to send me to Nineveh, and they'd repent, and you'd do this because you're so gracious and compassionate. Isn't that just it's hilarious that, that he didn't have enough self-awareness to hear it. But that's what we do sometimes. And so, like, if he'd heard himself, like, play the tape slowly, Jonah, of what you just said. Uh, and now, Lord, <laughs> oh, this is the very next verse. He's like, I knew you'd do this. And then he says, and now, Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better to die than to live. How I many you think no, Jonah had some deep problems going on in him? It was more than just, I, it's so funny because commentators talk about this and it's like, well, this all stems from his rebellion. No, he had some deeper problems <laughs> than just not doing it the first time. There's deep stuff. I want to go, Jonah, who hurt you? Somebody did. Like that goose at our park. Somebody hurt that mean goose. Anyway, that's, I said that Wednesday night. That's another story. Um, and so God said, the Lord replied. Okay, he said, I think he might be being dramatic. He said, Take my life from me. It's better to die than live. But the Lord replied. The Lord just simply replied. This makes me cry. It's beautiful. Have you any right to be angry? Now, I don't think that's scolding. I think he's saying, son, let's examine this. Because God will talk to you and get to the deep roots of your anger. Now, this picture, isn't that, look at his face. That is so poignant to me. A series of events happen. God's actually doing therapy with him, with object lessons. This, he goes out, and this vine grows up. He's watching to see if the city's destroyed or not, and he's out on a hill. This vine grows up and gives him shade because it's hot, but then a worm comes and destroys the vine, and every step of the way, he gets mad again. The, all this series of events keeps happening, and Jonah's just not getting it. And so at some, every step of the way, God goes, have you any right to be angry about the plant? Have you any be right to be? He's still digging to the depths of Jonah. Here's the deal. Jonah had a call on his life to be a prophet, but he didn't know the calling of knowing God. He didn't understand. It's just what Paul said in the transition today when he prayed. It's about our first calling is to be loved because we're going to be lousy at our calling if we're not loved. And Jonah had not been loved, and so he was really doing, even when he obeyed, he did it badly, didn't he? Because he was still going, I knew it. I knew you'd be good to them. Which is so obviously the wrong attitude, but man, when we don't know we're loved by the divine one, we don't act right. Because only he can love us in that core. So deep calls and even if you have an outward calling to business, to, to anything, to arts, to ministry on the platform, whatever you have an outward calling to, your real deeper calling that fuels that outward calling is to know him, to know him deeply. There's a deeper call God wants to extend to you. God is able to dig out your deeper call even when it's covered with deep hurt, pain, distrust, if this story speaks to you, go back and read all four chapters. It won't take you long. But you can just watch, read it from the lens of watching God work with Jonah. And actually, we're not told how well he ends up in the end. But I think God leaves that story open-ended. And we can say, Lord, I'll take it. Work in me. Work the call to just know you and not succeed and not perform. Jonah had a call to partner with God, but he had not yet let God's love partner with him. We all have deep callings and sometimes deep woundings. We are, whoops, we are all called. And I'm not going to take time to read those scriptures, but every believer has a calling and a preparation from God. There is no clergy laity divide in that sense. We are all called. But our first calling is to know him. In fact, the one thing I will say from that slide, the Greek word ecclesia, the root word of that is kaleo, the Greek word for call. So the church is the ones called, 
every one of us is called. Called to know him and then demonstrate him. I like to say calling is a desire that survives the fire. The Lord gave me that 30 years ago, and I'm still standing here saying it because I have a desire that survives the fire. But my genius, Mac, suggested that picture as one of my choices for slide design. It also suggested that picture. So sometimes the fire you feel is a nice sweet one on the beach. Oh, Lord, thank you that my calling is a desire that survives the fire. And then sometimes it's that. Anybody been in that fire? I want to tell you still, a calling is a desire that survives the fire. And sometimes the fire even revives and reveals the desire. Some callings get buried and God wants to go beyond them. This is the island of Iona in Scotland. It was a center for 300 years of Christianity. From The Celtic Christians came from Ireland, Patrick et al., and then Columba came over here to Iona, and from here, they basically evangelized all of Europe. It's hard to get to. You go from, it's the Hebrides. You go from the coast of Scotland to the Isle of Mull, which is basically a large island with one road across it and sheep and a couple of hotels. And we then, from there, you can't take a car to Iona. You can only take a ferry and you have to leave your car on Mull, rental car in our case. Paul and I went because it called out to us to go to Iona. The Abbey's there. You can see it. And uh, it was amazing. That's how it looked, but we missed the last ferry after we made it across the single line road that goes all across Mole, and we missed the last ferry. So we had to go back, and we got the last hotel room there. They had a, they had a flag. They had an American flag flying in that little bitty settlement. And when they served us dinner, I said, why is there an American flag? And he said, uh, we just do that for everyone that comes here to trace their roots. It makes them feel better. <laughs> they said we switch it out between the nations. <laughs> it was hilarious. They knew. But it's like a pilgrimage place. So, yeah, that's how it looked. We went to bed, and we were going to drive and catch the ferry first thing in the morning. But in the night, a gale force storm blew in. And so in the morning, we get up, and it is torrential it's gale force winds and so that's how we go to Iona and when we got to the abbey we couldn't get the door open we were in the, the rain was you know like pelleting and we're the door of the abbey's huge and there's no tour you're just wandering you know and we were like pulling the door open best day of my life really like I loved it because the Celtic saints they love that stuff and they used to go out in the ocean in a gale and pray just to like, come on, Lord, you know. So I was like, oh, this is perfect. But on the way over, we had to go down in the ferry. We couldn't, usually you'd sit on top and take in the view as you go over on the ferry. But we had to go below because the gale force winds and there were windows. And you have to know that the symbol of the Holy Spirit for the Celtic Christians was the wild goose because the wild goose is untamable. And so they would call the Holy Spirit the wild goose. And I looked out the window of the ferry, and there was a wild goose. But the waters were not placid like this. And in fact, I mean, the, the thing is, you know, the ferry was scary. And the wild goose kept getting pulled under. <laughs> and I, at first I went, symbol of the Holy Spirit, he's with me. And then down he went. <laughs> and I, I was like, oh, my word. Have you not felt like that in life? <laughs> You're like, hey. Where'd you go? I just was taking in your peacefulness. and that. But every time he went down, I mean, this, this goose accompanied us the little ferry ride over to Iona. And every time he went down, he popped back up. And I'll never forget it. It was there just for me because it was like, Perry, every time you think, where'd he go? All the stuff he put inside you will re-emerge. The callings are without repentance. The gifts and callings. Okay. Real quick, this is, uh, I, just, I won't tell you the whole story, but do you remember Zechariah and Elizabeth, the mother of John the Baptist? Do you remember their story? They had been praying, they were childless, and he was serving in the temple, and the angel came to him and said, your prayers have been heard. Do not be afraid, Zechariah, your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. But the Bible also says they were and the Greek 
translated perfectly is very old. So that artwork is probably accurate. So how many of you think the Greek word bears it out? It's the word desis for prayer. Desis is not a continual praying. Desis is a prayer you pray out of desperation in a moment. But you wouldn't keep praying it when that urgency passed. It's a prayer you pray in urgency. When the urgency passed, that's a different kind of prayer. So they were childless. They had desist prayed. How many of you think they might have not kept praying at this age? So they, how many of you have ever filed away something that you didn't get the prayer answered? And here comes the angel saying, I've come to tell you that prayer is being answered. One translation of that desis is, I've come to tell you the answer is coming to the prayer you have even quit praying. And I want to tell you, God many times will expand that. He's not answering what you've called out. He's answering the deeper call of your heart. So many of you somewhere in the past said, use me, oh God. I want to be surrendered and abandoned to you. He's still at work on that. If in the meantime you got in a mess and you went, get me out of this. Yeah, he comes to you. He aids you. But what is he doing? He's working on the deepest cry that you cried out to him at some point, and he's still on the job. He hasn't forgotten that prayer, and he hasn't forgotten you. It's, a, it's an amazing thing to take in. When you reach the depths, God's right there, and it doesn't leave. So, real quick, I'll just tell you, I got this picture, and I think it's maybe where a lot of us are. I thought about the phrase, deep, clean. Anybody ever used that phrase, to deep, clean? Some of you are smiling, and some of you are not smiling, and that is kind of the two types of people. To deep, clean is exceptionally intense cleaning process. The verb is to perform a deep clean. Okay, that's a pantry. That is not my pantry, but I had a pantry just like that three weeks ago. Now I have a pantry halfway like that. I decided to deep clean my pantry, and it honestly had no idea. But, you know, everything you do can have a spiritual edge to it, and it was like that. There are things I found, and I went, what is this? Do you have a pantry like that? Have you ever had a pantry like that? This morning, I did one more basket. So I got ready early, and I thought, I can just get that basket, and I got it down, and I was like, you know the shelf you avoid? It was that shelf. And life has happened. A lot has happened. And I pulled this thing down. I am not kidding you. I found a plaque I made for my youngest son at a birthday party where I had like a, it, it was a superhero birthday party, and I wrote out his superpowers. And the plaque was in a box with cookie cutters <laughs> in my pantry. And I went, Paul, why is this here? He goes, birthday party? And I went, yeah, but that is like, man, what was I thinking? I'm telling you, there, every diet fad, there was food from that. And then, really, how many knife and forks and cellophane does one need to save from the pandemic? There are so many that I really think that the bacteria I was desperate to keep them away from has crawled through the cellophane. And uh, they were all just, it was like, and then there's that thing of the, the, you know the basket where the onions live and the little flakes of the onion edges are in everything and there's a little vague smell of onion. Like I can't get through cleaning out the pantry and don't come do it for me because you can't clean out my pantry. You won't know what to do with that superpower thing that you throw that away. No, you can't throw that away. I'm giving it to the man. He has to keep it now. He's 25. So he's going to reread the prophetic stuff that's on it. <laughs> my mother owned crisp, um, um, cookie cutters for the entire nativity. I'm not kidding. And then some. And then some. Like probably, she had a set of probably 150 cookie cutters. Guess where they are. <laughs> could I throw those away? No, I could not because Esther, <laughs> won't that be fun? I'll let you know how that goes. But my point is, this is so stupidly hard. Do you hear me? And where my, I want to just get in there and go clean, 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 clean. Instead, it's been a process of thinking, that how, thinking through how we eat, thinking through how we live, thinking through what needs to stay and what needs to go. 
Do you think maybe our lives might be a little more like that than we admit? Do you think it might take some time? And I'll tell you why I hadn't done it before, because I didn't value it. I just thought, I'm going to do something important. That pantry doesn't matter. Well, at some point, when it reeks of onion flakes, I'm, there are spices from my childhood, I think. I may be exaggerating, but I didn't really realize spices went bad. So a lot of things had to go, but a lot of things didn't need to go. <laughs> Expiration dates. The point is, is anything in your pantry, your inner pantry, your spiritual pantry, that's way beyond its expiration date? Is there anything you got stuck on? Did you keep any plaques from a memory when you were too stressed to deal with it? Are there things from your past, from your childhood? All of us have these things. And you've got to be patient with the ride it takes. You've got to be patient with it taking a while. You've got to be patient with rethinking it. And then in the middle of that, my daughter-in-law, Alyssa, redid her pantry in one day because she's amazing like that and uh, she brought me all their old containers and so now I have containers so then my brain is going but what should be in that one and that one like how should I group that do we eat carbs or not I'm not sure anyway I'll I'll let you know I'll, I'll let you know back on that Naomi why don't you go ahead and come I think just uh we're gonna have Naomi come to help us close here but But I want to bring you to a place. Um, I want to show you a picture that is a painting I found that is entitled Psalm 42.7. That is deep calls to deep at the roar of your water spouts. All your waves and breakers have gone over me. And you can just uh, go ahead and whatever you feel behind me. So I want to show you that painting. And then I really want to bring it to a place I believe God wants to give us some encounters here as we close today. In Matthew 12, 28 through 42, Jesus links his death and resurrection to the Jonah story. So he compares himself. He says, like Jonah spent three days and nights in the belly of the whale, he's comparing himself to Jonah. But then he ends that comparison with these words. Now, one greater than Jonah is here. He went there three days and nights, not to the belly of a whale, but to the belly of hell. (laughs) He lived every brave and wave and breaker that was intended for us. I'm not now talking about the waves and breakers of God's love. I'm talking about the waves and breakers of life's onslaughts. You know, there can be waves and breakers of your own condemnation. Have you ever had a wave and breaker of fear, self-doubt, self-blame? Waves and breakers are not just circumstances. They're also onslaughts of accusation. They're onslaughts of fear. Whatever accompanies the circumstance. One writer said it this way. At the cross, Jesus becomes the bearer of our curse. Meaning he took on all that. That's what he took on at the cross. He let all the waves and breakers come on him. And he drowned under the sea of wrath that we disturbed, deserved. And in that moment of greatest conceivable agony, the infinite deep of the son's heart cried out in dereliction. And the word dereliction means dilapidated and unattended to. So he let himself, have you ever felt like you've ended up in dereliction, <laughs> ignored, unseen, and going downhill? He let himself go to that place so you wouldn't have to. He took on our dereliction. The infinite deep of the son's heart cries out in dereliction to the infinite deep of the father's heart. And the spirit, the bond of their union, resonates between the two in the harmony of our redemption. Deep in him, taking on our depth of sorrow, calls out to depths of love in the Father, and the Spirit makes the connection. And that's what that painting is demonstrating. Can you see that? The depths of circumstance closing in, the walls closing in. We use that phrase, I feel like the walls are closing in. The deep in Him cries out to the deep in God, and the Spirit parts the waters on the cross. So that psalm 
Psalm 42.7 was a messianic psalm in that part. Deep cries to deep at the roar of your water spouts, at the place you do business, God, at your throne. All your waves and breakers have gone over me. On the cross, deep called to deep and the waves and breakers washed over him for us. Therefore, no matter what depth of chaos we find ourselves in, we are guaranteed a connection by the Spirit to the holy healing chaos of His surging love and provision. That It's not deep cries to deep, maybe this will work. Deep cries to deep, and we're instantly entering to the very connection Jesus has with His Father. He paved the way. He pioneered the way for us. So it doesn't matter how deep you feel. If life's waves and breakers have overwhelmed you, just know they overwhelmed him on the cross so that waves and breakers of his endless love and provision could overwhelm us right in the middle of the chaos. Listen, I don't know if it upsets you to, for me to call it holy chaos. Eugene Peterson said chaos calls to chaos. But I'm talking about the chaos of the throne. There's some energy around the throne. Have you read about the throne? There's angels. There's freaky looking angels. There's angels with eyes on their backs and wheels and wheels. And there's creatures before the throne with four faces. What? I mean, there's some chaos. If you want a nice, neat, tidy God, you're, you're going to be disappointed. He's not evil chaos. He's not bad chaos, but he's got a dynamic system that is wilder than any earthly chaos. And that's what he wants to pour out on you. So this morning, as we close, I just want to invite you, whatever chaos you feel like you've been living in, how many of you would say, I've been in some depths. I've had some depths. It's okay. I mean, we all have some. But this morning, I hope that you can replace that story of being alone in those depths, life just hitting you, with realizing he's gone before you. And there is a way, like that picture shows, pioneered for his love to break right through. Break right through. There is a throne where all that activity, all that power, all that wisdom, all that revelation, there's a rainbow around the throne that's an emerald. What? It's a mystery. Our misery cries out to his mystery, and he doesn't sit idle. He wants to pour out his waves and breakers. So why don't we all stand together, and if this is particularly poignant to you, I believe right here, right now, right where you stand, you can have a depth of him pour out on you. Remember, God's depths are not meant to scare you. They're meant for you to bathe in. So this morning, Lord, we, your people, stand before you, and we acknowledge our humanity. We acknowledge that from our view on earth, sometimes life seems like waves and breakers that just keep hitting. But right now, we boldly say, Lord, we are candidates for your outpouring. Pour your depth of love on us. Father, I just, we just release you in this place and that anyone watching online and listening from afar. Father, some of us need, we just need some snorkeling. We just need a view of what you have for us. We just need to be reminded that there is more than our brain has been feeding to us. And right now, Lord, We just ask the Holy Spirit to come. We know you're already here, but into each and every heart. Right right now, the Lord may be giving somebody a picture. Just know that's him. He doesn't speak in a booming voice. Sometimes he gives you a thought, a picture. He can speak scripture because he wrote the scriptures, but he doesn't always speak that way. And if there's a picture rising up in you or just being presented to you get excited because that's him 
if it brings peace, understanding, and all the things that he brings. Thank you, Lord. We just say we're a church that wants to know the depths. I just sense the Holy Spirit speaking to someone. This may not be for everyone, but he's speaking to someone. I heard the deep cry of your heart when you were a teenager, and I'm still on that project, and nothing has disqualified you. That's for someone. Thank you, Lord. I want to go deeper, but I don't know how to swim. (laughs) The second line of that song says, I want to be meeker, but have you seen this old earth? Uh, If ever that's the truth. I want to be meeker, but I don't want to get eaten alive, man. (laughs) Listen. Whatever it is, God's calling you to the deep. He says yes to that cry. And that, my friends, I want to go deeper. That's the cry he rushes to. Naomi, would you lead us in? And then uh, and then we'll close for the day. week every single day God will show you the wonder not just of his creation but of your life there are treasures and gems hidden in your life and his working in you that he has waiting for you to see so we dismiss you with a blessing that you will have eyes to see the wonder of it all and that your heart will shift to living just to fall more in love with him may you be intoxicated with his goodness in your own story in Jesus name Amen. Thank you so much for joining the Abbey service today. We are so thankful for you, and we pray that this message blessed you this week. 
don't stop here. Stay connected with us by liking us on Facebook and subscribing to our YouTube channel. Please see below for additional ways to receive updates and news, as well as stay engaged with our Abbey community. You can also support the Abbey through giving on any of our platforms. We are grateful for your continued giving to help us reach people around the world and grow the kingdom through local and international missions. Thank you again for watching. We love you and God bless.